A lot happened in between the release of Darksiders 2 and 3, including, well, all the fans believing Darksiders was done for good after the closure of Visual Games just five months after the release of Darksiders 2, and publishers uninterested in picking up the license from THQ. As a fan of the Darksiders series, this was a gut punch because, well, as I said in my Darksiders 2 retrospective, it's one of my favourite games of all time. And also, we'd only seen two out of the four horsemen, and I wanted to see what they would do with Fury and Strife. But as with any series, no matter how much you love it, a blow like that usually means a series is just done, and you move on. You can imagine my surprise then when four years later, the reveal trailer for Darksiders 3 dropped. This time developed by Gunfire Games, a new studio who were founded by David Adams, one of the first developers who started working on Darksiders at Vigil Games. But back in 2017, I didn't care about any of that. I was just so happy to see Darksiders was officially back. I pre-ordered the game on the spot and waited patiently until November 2018, when after six long years, I finally got to continue my Darksiders journey. And yeah, I was pretty disappointed with the game. I just found myself getting bored in Darksiders 3. I wasn't big on the Souls-like change of direction, and all I could do was compare the game to Darksiders 2, which it just didn't stack up. That hype train is an unpredictable beast, but more often than not, it does lead to disappointment, which sometimes isn't always the game's fault. Lofty expectations building over years, it'll warp your perception, and it's why I'm actually really excited to revisit Darksiders 3 today. When you revisit a game that you found disappointing, especially due to hype, what happens when you go back and give the game a second go is, more often than not, it is better than you remember. And that's why I love coming back to these sorts of games. So, after finally revisiting Darksiders 3, the question is pretty simple. Is Darksiders 3 better than I remembered? Let's find out. Just quickly before we get started, this is now my third video on the Darksiders series so far, so if you've just found the channel, I recommend catching up on this series of retrospectives. Click the link in the top right hand corner or in the description below for the playlist, and what the hell, subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Alright, let's get started. Darksiders 3's story takes place parallel to the events of Darksiders 2 and before most of the original Darksiders, and sees our protagonist Fury, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, summoned by the Charred Council, who task her with hunting down the seven deadly sins who have escaped their imprisonment. To be sure Fury sticks to her mission, the Council assign Fury a Watcher, and we head to the war-torn, post-apocalyptic Earth. Pretty much immediately after arriving on Earth, Fury encounters and defeats the first of the Sins, Envy, and claims her talisman to use as a prison to hold her and the rest of the Sins. Along Fury's travel, she finds a sanctuary named Haven, where she meets a maker named Ulthane, as well as a small surviving group of humans. Ulthane asks Fury to send back any humans she finds on her mission to Haven, pleading that their lives are worth saving. Fury then leaves and soon after finds the next sin, Wrath, who mortally wounds the horseman after she's distracted by the sudden death of her horse, Rampage. Fury is saved when a portal opens up below her and takes her to the Lord of the Hollows, a powerful being with the ability to release beings from the cycle of life, death, and rebirth in the Well of Souls. The Lord heals Fury and reveals that she is being manipulated by the Chart Council for their own personal schemes. He then gifts her with a mystical artifact known as the Fire Hollow, which enhances her combat prowess, and after various sins being hunted down and captured, the Lord of Hollows gifts Fury with more and more special hollows in Storm, Force, and Stasis. Once we have captured six of the seven sins, we finally face off against and defeat the final sin, Pride, who reveals that the Council have been secretly betraying their so-called balance 
behind everyone's back since the beginning. It's at this point where the Watcher reveals herself to be the real Envy, tricking Fury and the Council to strengthen herself by absorbing the rest of the sins into her amulet, gaining all their powers. Envy uses her talisman to immobilize Fury and takes her powers as well, telling her that the Council tried to pit the Horsemen against the Sins in hopes they'd annihilate each other. Fury then swiftly falls to the Earth, but is saved by the humans she had rescued along the way, and Ulthane reveals that he has constructed a gateway that allows Fury to confront both Envy and the Council. Fury then heads through the portal, arrives at the council chambers, and defeats Envy. The council almost immediately after turn on the rider who holds off their attacks by detonating the Talisman of Sin and retreats back to Earth. Once back on Earth, Fury helps the Makers defend the humans escaping through the reflecting pool to another realm whilst Haven is attacked by demons. Fury, without a mission or purpose anymore, decides to follow the humans as their new protector, asking Ulthane to help her brother War if he ever comes across him. Before Fury can leave through the portal, she notices one of the humans helping to defend the Makers from the attack, who is quickly revealed to be Strife in disguise, another one of the horsemen. In an after credit scene, it is revealed through another conversation between Lilith and Lucifer that they know Fury has gone to protect the humans, and depending on your choices in game, he is either livid or cocky that his plans are in danger or going as planned. And that's the story for Darksiders 3. First things first, as you may be able to tell from the length of this synopsis, the story isn't a primary focus in regards to the Darksiders 3 package, but then again, there is a lot more story to this game that either I didn't personally experience, or they are story moments that build character more than progress the story forward, if you know what I mean. Before I jump into that though, I do want to say, I really enjoyed the story here quite a bit. It has its flaws and loose ends that never tie up, at least to my knowledge. Like seriously, what the hell happened to Rampage? They built it up, constantly brought it into the limelight through the dialogue between Fury and the Sins, and then just blue-balled me on that one, which was a letdown. But overall, the story ended up being something I really enjoyed about Darksiders 3, which was not the case from the start. In the beginning, Fury isn't a likeable protagonist, and whilst that doesn't need to be a requirement in some game stories, the more unlikable your character is, the less I want to listen to them talk. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand why Gunfire Games made this decision, and I do want to say, I loved where her character ended up by the end of Darksiders 3 and that path of character growth. But much like her name suggests, in the beginning, probably up until just before Lust, she is just this vessel of hatred and anger that I personally am okay with, but just not for half the game. Again, I get it, the character description is sort of in the name, but when compared to War or Death, their character wasn't defined by destruction or, well, death. They had more subtleties and more depth to their characters that Fury eventually has as well, but in my opinion, it just takes a little too long to get there. I understand the vengeance and anger for moments like Rampage's death or the constant flaunting of his corpse but most of the time she comes off as arrogant, which just isn't an enjoyable trait to have in a primary protagonist. As I said though, she does improve vastly from Lust onwards, and it's from here where the story truly sank its hooks into me and didn't let go. I mean, you have moments like the illusion with all four of the horsemen together, which, whilst an illusion, is no less awesome. Fury's mercy and empathy when it comes to the angel Usiel. After he succumbs to the illusions of lust, her growing relationship with the humans feels natural and truly makes her character, by the end, feel like a selfless protector. I think you notice the change in Fury the most between the two battles against Wrath. The first fight, she's, as I described, arrogant and angry with not much else to her character, but near the end of this journey and the second encounter with Wrath, you notice just how far she has come. One, she's a likeable character who I wanted to hear her speak, but she doesn't blindly rely on anger to battle and comes in more clear-headed in combat. And even when Fury does express anger or 
well, Fury in the later parts of the game, again, it's not her only emotion or trait, and it's understandable why she feels this way. Like facing off against Envy, who used her, or saving the council only to be betrayed once she questions their intentions of upholding the balance. Fury can be angry, but it plays out much much better when that's not all she is. And when it was all said and done, I ended up loving her as a protagonist. There is more to this story than what I went over in the synopsis though. I mean, the dialogue between the Sins and Fury alone is filled with story primarily related to the Council and why they're not to be trusted. Fans already knew this, but Fury doesn't, and they delve out more and more information in this arc really well, which is why when you stumble across the Sins, you're excited not only to see what Gunfire Games depicted them as, but what story they add to the table. There is a big piece of story I missed in my playthrough of Darksiders 3 though, and that is in regards to the Lord of the Chosen and finding the demon Abraxas. This omission on my behalf and plain not knowing about it is probably due to my lack of investment in the story at that point in the game, but I just had no idea this was a thing that apparently has some big implications in the story. Abraxas forewarns Fury about the Destroyer and gifting Abraxas' soul to the Lord gives you a mysterious talisman that the Council and Lucifer are deathly afraid of. Not gonna lie, learning about this little quest arc made me want to jump back into Darksiders 3 on New Game Plus to see what was going on, but a pretty cool side story that expands the world for well, players who pay attention. As I've said in other retrospectives for Darksiders though, what really engages me in these stories is good characters, and whilst they aren't all incredible, most of them are pretty damn engaging. The Seven Sins are really interesting, and again, add a lot of intrigue and right type of questioning that makes their inevitable boss fight all the sweeter after the incessant taunting. The Watcher, or Fury, has this weird vibe of admiration from the beginning, and whilst the twist ending of her being Fury is surprising, you can see her character changing from admiration to almost disgust through Fury changing in attitude. She adds a lot to Fury's character, which is really well done. Volgram's back and in a more talkative manner than 2, which is great, though he talks about the Crucible, too much after a while. I'm not playing the Crucible Volgrim, leave me be. Ulthane and his mission to help the humans is admirable. The Charred Council are finally shown to be this hypocritical entity we've known they were since the original. Usiel and his uneasy alliance with Fury is a dynamic not seen since Darksiders 1, which I thought was a nice throwback. The Lord of the Chosen is this mysterious figure that whilst didn't expand as much for me, is still compelling enough to just see it and listen, and again, seeing all the horsemen together was amazing. But how about that strife reveal? Ends up making a lot more sense when that human was questioning Fury in the beginning, and then the badass introduction? Love it. Made me excited to play Genesis. Look, overall, the story does have flaws. It's not perfect, nor does it add as much to the backstory as, say, Darksiders 2. But when this story sunk its hooks in, it never let go. I really did end up enjoying this story a lot, even if it begins on average grounds. It's not as deep or ever-present as the previous entries, but the characters are really interesting and the task is simple, but Fury evolves nicely through this journey. The sins are compelling, taunting Fury in their own unique ways, and the badass moments are just as incredible as ever if not better. Again, loose ends, plot holes, that sort of thing are here, and the story doesn't feel as fleshed out as other entries. But for a more simplistic story skeleton, primarily focused on creating badass boss fights, I did have a lot of fun with this story. It may not be the best, but it certainly is enjoyable, and the story can be more or less complex depending on your choices and what you find in this world, which is a storytelling component I do love to see. Okay, let's get this out of the way right now. Does Darksiders 3 feel like I'm playing a Darksiders game? Not particularly. Do I think that makes Darksiders 3 a bad game then? No, I don't. 
Darksiders 3's gameplay is very different from the rest of the series, even though at its core, it still contains a lot of those same pillars. Hack and slash combat, platforming and puzzles are still present in Darksiders 3, but they use very differently. Now I'm not saying Darksiders ever really had a formula, I mean the changes between the original and the sequel showed that this series evolves and changes with each horseman, but they never ventured off from the Zelda meets God of War path quite like Darksiders 3. Darksiders 3 feels like you're playing a Souls-like, but with more Metroidvania mechanics. Dungeons are essentially gone, even though the locales still at times feel like they have that same sort of vibe. That dungeon path of progression is also gone, mixing in combat, platforming and puzzles far less. Darksiders 3 is very combat centric, you don't get as lengthy a break between combat encounters, and really the game is focused on you finding those seven sins which are highlighted through a navigation bar. Your objective through the various locations is also much different from before because of the heavy combat and souls like systems. You're scouring the environments to find various shards, upgrade materials, souls to level up, finding shortcuts to make death less of a hassle. In short, before diving into all these changes in depth, Darksiders 3 feels quite alien to the fans of the series. I do not think that makes Darksiders 3 a bad game though, because I actually really enjoyed my time playing through this game. I do think it fails though in being a Darksiders game, or at least feeling like a Darksiders experience. It's just a bit too different. This is a point I'll elaborate on further, but for now, enough teasing and let's dive into the gameplay Starting off with combat. First things first in regards to Darksiders 3's combat. I think it meshes Souls-like and Darksiders S combat really, really well. When the enemies allow for it, mostly in the early portion of the game, Darksiders 3's combat feels right at home with the rest of the series. Fury's Whip is a badass and unique weapon that is both speedy has good range and deals a solid amount of damage. You end up with four extra weapons, all with unique movesets and wrath abilities. You still have your myriad of combinations that are tied to timing button presses. A fury mode, all those sorts of things that made up Darksiders style of combat are still here. Maybe even more so if you play the game on Classic, I believe, which changes combat to a more Darksiders style apparently. Though I personally didn't check it out so I can't comment on how this affects combat. The early game combat compared to the late game though is very different, which I believe was done to ease fans into the Souls-like fashion of combat. One of the big differences here in Darksiders 3's combat is the way enemies behave, which in turn forces the player to change how they react. Enemies this time around come in all shapes and sizes, but more so in regards to their methods of attack. Some are group or swarm-like, some sit back and block, others can tank through damage not interrupting their own attack animations, some wait for counters, and others are just big beefy bastards. So your approach to combat in Darksiders 3 is very different. Sometimes it's go go go, others it's stay close and utilize iframes through dodging, some require a bigger hit to break their block, or just wait around and counter, but in general the combat is much more methodical and slower paced. Yes, there are bursts of speed, but mostly you're waiting for your enemies to give you an opening. This sense of danger is also heightened through the limited health pool shards having a cooldown before using another, and that threat of death meaning you need to backtrack all the way up to where you were if you had a few souls on you when you died. Again, the combat itself, such as your attacks with the whip or any of the different hollow weapons, in essence are much like before, but it's the way you play and that threat of death that changes how you play this time around. I really enjoyed how this combat functioned, which I know might not be a surprise to fans of the channel who know I'm a massive Souls fan. But that doesn't mean Souls likes are an easy genre to pull off, and I think in regards to the combat in Darksiders 3, they succeeded. It's by no means the most challenging Souls-like or even the most challenging of the series. In fact, I think I died more in Darksiders 2. 
But that tense feeling you get when you're near death and need to find some breathing room is no less stressful and the enemies do a good job at keeping you on your toes and constantly teaching you different ways of approaching foes in battle. Learning how these enemies move and attack is just satisfying because when you start learning these moves and knowing them and that muscle memory kicks in, you're dodging, dealing big damage with counters, using all your resources, when you have encounters that just flow so beautifully, barely getting a scratch, not only does it make you feel like one of the horsemen, but it gets your blood pumping, wanting to see if you can do it again, but better. The flow of combat when you put your full arsenal into it is something that is incredibly fun and satisfying because you can be punished for silly mistakes or lapse in concentration just as easily. It's that sort of fair punishment, the type where if you get hit or even die, usually you're blaming yourself and not the game because the enemy encounters have been lessened in number. They telegraph their attacks well and outside of a few enemies like the big shielded ones feel like they leave enough openings and counter options that if you do get hit, well look out for what's going on. I will say the Storm Wrath ability does impact enemy visibility a little too much, which is a shame as I think it's the best one in the game, but I need to be able to see what my enemy is doing in this type of game. In regards to the combat or combat preparation, as I said, you can find or purchase both shards and upgrade materials around the world or from Volgrim. These shards come in the form of health, wrath, fury, fortification, undying, and a few others that I personally rarely use to help you stay as combat efficient as possible in the longer encounters or boss fights. These shards do have a 10 second cooldown, so if you need to heal and are out of your Nephilim, respite, essentially your Estus Flask, you need to be aware that you won't be able to do much else for another 10 seconds. I actually really like this cooldown because you end up with so many of these different shards that if you could just keep popping them, the combat would be stupidly easy. But with the cooldown, you end up stressing out a lot more and strategizing about what needs to be done first. Fury is often a good option as you get invincibility, quick attacks and health regen, but the shards are much rarer. So maybe you go for fortification to lessen the impact of the harder hitting foes, but you're still taking damage. It's these sorts of decisions that make the combat encounters much more engaging and adds another strategic element on top of the slower paced combat. As for the upgrade materials, you can increase the number of your Nephilim's respite, how much health they recover, Cover, talismans that you can equip to your weapons can be upgraded with either angelic or demonic artifacts that increase specific stats, and weapon wise, well upgrading those means they deal more damage. You can also spend your souls at Volgrim to level up and put a point into either health, physical or arcane damage. The RPG mechanics aren't as deep as say Darksiders 2 but it feels right at home in the Souls-like genre and these rewards and wanting to power up your combat powers is enough to want to go out, explore and gather souls, materials and shards. The big reason you want to be as prepared combat wise as possible is for those boss encounters. Again, they aren't all the most challenging fights, but they can put you in your place if you aren't prepared or lapse in concentration. They are all good fun and satisfying to conquer though. There's no big like, yes, moments where the boss had whooped you over and over again, but some definitely made me try again and go in more prepared. They're a good time above all else though. Now there are bosses outside of the Seven Sins, which are again a good time, but today I want to focus on the Sins because I didn't face every boss in this world, and whilst the battles I found were good fun and some tough fights, the Sins are the cream of the crop. As is often the case, the first boss fight against Envy isn't anything special. I mean, it is literally after about 10 minutes of playing the game, so tutorial boss definitely applies. Envy has big attack cues, involves some platforming tutorials, and overall is a pretty easy fight. Given my health bar doesn't say that, but that's because I get falling in the platforming segments, which pertains to an issue I'll touch on when it comes to the puzzles and platforming. But yeah, solid tutorial fight good way to ease players into the combat. The second sin we encounter is against Wrath, who we actually fight twice. 
The fights are pretty similar from one another, so I'm going to go over both now. Wrath is a decent sized hulking boss, but he's deceptively quick. He's a great boss for the early game as he packs a punch, has fair attack timings and can be easily punished, but you can just as easily be punished. The arena is a nice size to make for a tense encounter and in general, we're still only about an hour into the game, so he makes for a great dodging and countering tutorial. When we encounter him again, it is in this large arena. He starts off much bigger than before and can regain health through killing enemies. By this point though, he is a piece of cake. You can easily wail on him, do enough damage to make regen irrelevant, but it is satisfying to finally conquer him after all this time. Wrath overall is another good fight, but the lack of tools in the first fight definitely makes it more tense than later in the game. The next sin, I'm going off these in the order I believe you find them in, but you might be able to mix up the order. The next sin we come up against is Avarice, who is an entertaining battle, but sort of simple. Avarice has a massive arena and utilizes height to his advantage, but his windups for attack are very, very obvious. He is a counter-attack's wet dream. Again, still a fun fight, but predictable. Then we have a battle against the Sin Sloth, who, if I was to compare a fight, he feels a bit like the Asylum Demon. He doesn't have many attacks, mainly slamming and swinging his stick club, but he does enough damage to worry you and make you cautious of becoming overconfident. Again, wind-ups are simple to nail down, dodge and counter for the win. I wasn't as prepared for this battle as some of the others, so this was a tense battle for me, but not too bad overall. Then we come up against the Sin Lust, and about halfway through also have to battle the Angel Usiel. This battle is probably the player's first true test, or at least that's how I felt, because Lust is no joke. She's quick, loves to dash around, jump about, spin and slicing attacks that have smaller windows to dodge. She is a serious threat, and then you pair her up with an albeit slower boss in Uziel, but he still hits like a truck, and you have to worry about both attacking you. This fight is so much fun though. Lust doesn't have this massive health pool, but you have less opportunity to attack her, so it makes for this great chess match. Match. Big enough arena to feel like you can get some space, but she covers ground quickly too, so it feels like a good size. Tense but extremely fun battle that had me on the edge of my seat, even with as many resources as I could spare. The next battle is against the Sin Gluttony, who... Yeah, he got me a few times. He just doesn't have a lot of chances to hit him, so you need to make sure you're getting space from his big arena length attacks, but coming back just as quickly to deal some damage. He hits like an absolute truck too. After phase one though, we go to phase two, which is really just swimming around and waiting for him to inhale a bomb. Sort of a lackluster ending to the fight after the struggle of phase one. As much as I enjoy a good challenge though, I do think Gluttony doesn't give the play enough of an opportunity to get hit forcing the player to circle and circle for a bit too long. Don't get me wrong, it's tense, but just not executed perfectly. Enjoyable and challenging, just not amazing. Next up is the Sin Pride, who is very similar to Lust in speed, but this time she has access to magic and ranged attacks, a constant laser in the arena, and a shield to break on top of that. This is a tense, edge of your seat battle. She again doesn't have a wealth of health, but with that shield, her quick attacks, magic homing missiles, a laser beam, it makes it hard to deal too much damage before retreating. Nice size arena, well telegraphed attacks, just good old fashioned challenge that puts you to the test. Probably my favorite fight in the game alongside Lust. I love this fight. And lastly, we have, well, the real Envy. Envy has a ton of attacks at her disposal. She has guns, a scythe, a blade, can summon the other sins to deal a special attack. She does have a good amount of wind up to her attacks though, and if I'm honest, I probably sweat more in the pride fight. She can put you in your place, don't get me wrong, but she leaves herself wide open and is easily counted, leaving her exposed for a good few hits. I did really enjoy this battle, but it for me wasn't the peak of the boss's difficulty. 
Great fun though. Once again, there are more bosses than just the sins to face off against, but in regards to the main battles, I think the sins are a lot of fun to hunt down and defeat. Some took me a few tries, others were a one and done, but they were all satisfying to defeat and still stick to that Darksiders theme of badass boss fights. As I mentioned in the beginning of this segment though, combat does take up a majority of your journey to find and capture the seven sins, which means the platforming and puzzles took the hit in terms of how present they are in the Dark Side's formula. Don't get me wrong, they are still here. You'll still have those moments of just puzzles, like one of my favorites involving the tornado forcing you into the subway system and forcing blocks to move out of place, or the platforming moments like when you gain the force hollow and can platform underwater. I'm not saying they're gone, but they just aren't as involved, more so used in ways to further explore and do side activities, like figuring out how to use one of the beetles to unlock a secret, or freezing certain death traps to fall below and grab something awesome. You have different hollows that affect both platforming and puzzles, like lava or fire traversal, walking on water, floating up into the air, a super jump, a supercharged slam, hover, a rock ball, and wall jump but they aren't really used the same way they were before. We don't have these dungeons anymore. The locales feel similar to dungeons to explore, use platforming and puzzles to progress, but they are more so used to explore the locales fully and find secrets and upgrades. The world is designed in a more Metroidvania style. You unlock more and more abilities, but mostly they're for optional locales like the underwater city, which is completely optional, but by far one of the most stunning environments environments in the game. It's this world and the way you explore, the reason you explore, and how the platforming and puzzles are pushed to the side though that makes Darksiders 3 feel like Darksiders adjacent. The combat at its core feels similar. The way you explore the world, puzzles and platforming, all that stuff is like Darksiders, but the Souls-like aspects push that formula to the side in favour of well, souls. Again, the world is a pure joy to explore, the locales are stunning, the combat is good fun, the bosses are great tests of your combat abilities, the platforming is satisfying aside from the grapple hook swing not working at times, and the puzzles, whilst repetitive with a lot of block slamming, after you unlock the force hollow, are still enjoyable. Darksiders 3 is a game I really enjoyed playing. Honestly, it just for reasons I can't exactly put my finger on doesn't feel like a Darksiders experience. It might be the lack of dungeons or the heavy combat focus, but whilst fun, something about Darksiders 3 just doesn't quite meet those Darksiders series expectations. So, was Darksiders 3 better than I remembered? Hell yeah it was. I thoroughly enjoyed my time playing Darksiders 3. I really loved this story and Fury's character arc. I loved the combat and the more Souls-like approach. The bosses are tense and engaging battles. The platforming is vast and varied. The puzzles can be at times brain teasers and the locales are stunning. I think Darksiders 3 is a good game. I just don't think it's a great Darksiders game. It has the pillars of the Darksiders formula right. It at times captures this series formula in a new way, but mostly it just feels like this game could have been called something else because it doesn't feel exactly a part of the series. Again, it's like Darksiders-esque. It doesn't feel like a spin-off or anything like that, and I'm not saying a series can't change or I wouldn't like to see the series tackle the Souls-like genre again but I wouldn't mind seeing them return to Darksiders 2 either. I'm just conflicted, I think. I loved playing this game, and I really did enjoy all 9 or so hours with the game and exploring as much as possible. I don't know how to explain it, something about the game just feels off when compared to the series. With all this talk about is it a good Darksiders game versus a good game, at the end of the day, does that matter? Does it matter if at the end of the day the game is still enjoyable? That answer is up to you. On its own though, or just critiquing the game by itself, 
I do recommend giving Darksiders 3 a go, especially if you're looking for a nice Souls-like. I truly did enjoy my time playing through this game. I do not think it's a bad game or even an average game, and whatever the next 3D hack and slasher in the series may be, I'm excited to see where Gunfire Games takes it. But for now, we just have one more game in the series to go, and... Well, this one changes up the series quite a lot on the surface. Thank you all so much for watching my Darksiders 3 retrospective. I had a lot of fun revisiting Darksiders 3, and I hope you enjoyed revisiting the game with me. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave it a like because it helps let me know that you enjoyed yourself. Comment below your thoughts on Darksiders 3 or the series in general, as well as any suggestions for games you want to see covered in the future. Shout out to the channel members Ish, France, Christian and Cloud for that extra level of support. I truly do appreciate it. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe. Go give my socials a follow if you fancy at Hairbear. Join the Discord server to have a chat and I'll catch you all in the next video.